Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to Wednesday evening Bible study. It has been a beautiful day, although it's been kind of chilly outside. Uh, the sun has been shining, and the snow that the Lord sent our way last night has all but melted away by now. Uh, I hope you've been able to enjoy some of this beautiful day, and I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. While uh, various ones are joining in with us this evening, I want to take a few moments to just highlight a few things that we can celebrate. Uh, this past Sunday, Matt and Teresa Harvey had a wedding anniversary, and we want to celebrate that with them. At least I believe it was Sunday. It might have been Saturday. But uh, we, are, we want to say congratulations to Matt and Teresa Harvey. We also want to say happy birthday to Sherry Blevins. Today is her birthday, and I'm sure she is 29 years old and holding. So happy birthday, Sherry. And if you haven't had a chance to say happy birthday to her, you may want to give her a call and just let her know uh, you're thinking about her and tell her happy birthday. Also, today is Robbie and Joyce Curry's second wedding anniversary. Congratulations to you guys. We're so very happy and uh, that we can celebrate that with you. And uh, Buddy and Rhonda Barber are celebrating an anniversary today. I don't know what number wedding anniversary it is for you guys, but hey, happy anniversary. God bless you, and we celebrate with you. Thank you again for tuning in this evening. Thank you for sharing this with your friends and your neighbors. Uh, while we can't gather up like we normally do in the building, we are able to join in this online and virtual format and one of the advantages to that is you can share this with friends. You can do a watch party. You can do various things through social media to um, share this with others. And many of you have been doing that, and I'm so grateful for that. Now, I want to thank you also for your faithful giving. You have been supporting this ministry with your generous donations, and, and we are grateful for that. Thank you so much. I want to make you aware of another area of giving that you might want to consider. Uh, we've been thinking about how can we tangibly help folks through this pandemic time. And we got word through actually another church in the state of an idea that they're doing, and we want to give that a try here. And here's what they're doing, what we'd like to do as well. We want to uh, be mindful of our essential workers. There are various ones out there right now who have to be at work, and they're working really, really hard, uh, putting their lives on the line in some cases. We just want to appreciate them, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to provide some meals for them. Now, we have targeted the essential workers in a few different areas. Some are in the medical field. Some are in food service, particularly when it comes to the grocery stores and that kind of thing. And then others are in the package and delivery service. And what we're going to do is provide some meals for the, their work staff in some local areas, some local businesses, and we're going to use local restaurants to do that. So if you would like to make a donation to the Essential Worker Meal Fund, you can do so by going to our website, godisgoodonmahood.com. If you'll click on the Give button and then click on uh, the Give through Tithely, you'll go to Tithely, the app that we use for our electronic uh, donations, and you can make a donation there, and you need to designate it where it says general. There's a drop-down bar, and you can click on that, and you can, get, uh, you can designate it for the Essential Worker Meal Fund. Uh, you can give that way to that effort uh, with your special donation, or if you would like to make a special donation by way of check, you can write out a check to the First Church of God, um, and you can mail it in to uh, the church office, 301, uh, 301 Mahood Avenue, here in Princeton, West Virginia, 24740. Again, any money that you give to the Essential Meal or Essential Worker Meal Fund will go to provide meals for uh, local uh, people working in these industries, and just to to say that we love you and we appreciate you. And 100% of your donation, your designated giving in that area, will go for that effort. All right, uh, before we get into Bible study tonight, we want to take a moment to pray together. And I want to update you on some of the prayer requests that we've been giving uh, you and then maybe share a few others with you tonight. 
Uh, thank you for praying for Heather, our church secretary. She is doing better. She's back at work. She had a tooth pulled last week, and she's doing great now. So thank you for that. Please continue to pray for Nora Keaton. She has an appointment scheduled to go to Charleston on a little later in April, and she's going to be consulting with a surgeon there. They believe that though she has been diagnosed with cancer, the testing has shown that it's not spread anywhere else. It's in an isolated area, and we thank the Lord for that. They believe they can take care of her situation with surgery and make her cancer free, and she goes to follow up with that a little later on in April. So please be in prayer for Nora. We want to be in prayer for Mr. Gary Hatfield. This is a family friend of Ruth Ann Earps and her family. Uh, he has been diagnosed with cancer and it is spread in various parts of his body and he's not doing well at all. So we would appreciate your continued prayers for Gary Hatfield. Please continue to pray for Regina Sneed. She had to go to the ER this week with a very severe nosebleed. They got her taken care of with that and sent her home. She had to go back the next day for a quick follow-up, and we just want to continue to pray for Regina as she is just not feeling well. Brian Hawks is battling a sinus infection. Please continue to remember him in prayer. Rhonda Barber is going through chemotherapy. Um, that is an ongoing thing, and we just want to continue to lift up Rhonda in our prayers. We want to remember, especially through this time, let's pray for our government leaders at a local level, at a state level, at a government level, and even at a worldwide level now. They're dealing with a lot and trying to uh, help get this pandemic not only under control but eliminated, and we just want to pray that they will have God's guidance and direction. I'm sure there are other requests that you may have, and we welcome you to uh, share those with us in the comments or in a direct message. And uh, we would be, we'd love to know those and we want to be mindful of them so we can be praying about them. But let's agree in prayer together tonight. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you again for your grace and for your mercy. And I thank you so much, Lord, for what you are doing uh, for us and through us. Lord, thank you that Heather is feeling better. We pray you'd continue to touch and bless her and keep her close to you. Thank you, Lord, um, for the good news that Nora received, and we just pray that you would be with her as she prepares to do further uh, follow-up with other doctors. We just ask that you would guide this process and that you would bring healing to her body. We pray, Father, tonight that you would be with Mr. Gary Hatfield. We ask that you would have mercy on him and that, Lord, um, you would draw him near to you, and, and we would pray for his physical healing. But Lord, we commend him into your hands and pray for him and for his family and just ask, Lord, that you would do what is the kindest thing in this situation. Lord, uh, comfort this family and keep them close to you through this time. We pray for Brian tonight. We ask that your hand of healing would be upon him. We pray for Regina. Comfort Lord and keep her close to you. Help her to feel better this evening, we pray. We do ask, Father, that you would be with our government leaders. We pray you'd give them wisdom and guidance as uh, they lead through this most difficult time. And we pray, Father, that there would indeed be a, a very quick end to this pandemic. Lord, uh, we pray for your covering over our lives. Lord, for those who are sick, we pray for healing. Lord, for those of us who are well, we pray for your continued covering to keep us that way. Lord, we ask tonight that you would help us as we look into your word. We pray that your spirit would guide and direct our steps and help us, Lord, to learn and grow that we might be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to look with me tonight in Philippians, uh, the third chapter. We're going to be begin tonight and uh, we're going to finish next Wednesday night in this two-part study out of Philippians chapter 3. And uh, the verse in particular that we're going to look at tonight is starting at verse 10. Now, I want to remind you, we've been going over um, the book of Philippians for the last few weeks in our Bible study. And, and just let me remind you of this. Your spiritual growth is ultimately up to you. Uh, how close you get to God in large part rests with you. And how close I get to God in large part really rests with me. In the book of James, it says if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And that precious promise is important because 
it, it reminds me that I've got to do my part to, to draw close to God, and He's going to do His part to draw close to me. So my spiritual growth at the end of the day, I am the one responsible for it. And one of the ways that I am to grow is by studying the Word, uh, reading it regularly, trying to discern what it truly says, and then applying it to my life. And while I'm doing that, one of the things that's helpful for me that I'm finding again that is vital is memorizing the Word of God. And by memorizing it, I mean not just getting it in my memory so that I can recite it, but truly hiding it in my heart, as David said in the Psalms, so that we don't sin against God. Now, we've been going through Philippians chapter 4, and there were several verses that we went over there, beginning in and around uh, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Uh, and it says things like this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say, Rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the, God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, now, a few weeks ago, when we looked over those verses, as we were talking about them, uh, we noted Paul wrote these words while he was in prison. And he, he was in circumstances nobody wanted to be in. Most of us can identify with that now. We've, we've been in circumstances for quite some time that we didn't want, we didn't ask for. Uh, I spoke with Joyce Curry today, asked her how she was doing, how today was for her. She says, it's like Groundhog Day. It's the same day over and over. Most of us can identify with that, amen. But Paul, though he was in circumstances he did not like and did not want, he found that he could still rejoice in the Lord. He went on to say in Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, uh, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, Paul challenges us in those verses to think on the things that are going to help us uh, have a mindset that focuses on God and the things that he has for us. We want to fill our minds with the things of God so that our minds can be renewed and we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind and be more like Christ. Paul went on to say in that particular uh, chapter, he says, But I have rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that your care for me at last has flourished again, uh, though surely you did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to want or to need, uh, for I have learned in whatever state I am therein to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to be abound, and I know how to abound, rather. Uh, in everything and in all things, uh, or everywhere and in all things, I know both, I have learned how to both be full and to be hungry, to both uh, abound and to suffer need. Then he says these words in Philippians 4.13 that are classic scripture, that words that we've memorized, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul learned in the middle of a prison situation that with his faith in Christ, he can be content. If he had a little or he had a lot, he knew how to just cope and God helps us do that when we put our faith and our trust in him now I've been committing those verses to memory and my method for doing that is a little bit old school I've been writing them down on these index cards and going around and going over them as I walk and exercise and do different things and sitting in my office some or sitting at home and, and again I'm doing this not to get a gold star and a candy bar but because I believe with all of my heart that when we hide God's word in our heart, it'll help us to truly not sin against him, as David said. But it also puts something within our minds and within our spirit that the Holy Spirit can, with, can recall when, help us recall when we need it. That is part of the Holy Spirit's function. 
Now tonight, I want to look at a different part of Philippians. It's in Philippians chapter 3. It's beginning at verse 10. And I'm in the process of working on memorizing uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 16. And evidently, my handwriting is of such that I've got to have two index cards to put all of those verses on. And I know that's quite a few verses. Um, but I want us to focus in on just part of this tonight. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, here's what Paul says. That I may know him, speaking of Christ, and the power of his resurrection. We just celebrated that resurrection this past Sunday, didn't we? Paul's saying here, I want to know him, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Okay, let me make sure I'm getting that right. Being Yes, that is in just verse 10. That is uh, where that part of it ends. Now, I want you to think about just one small part of this verse with me tonight. Paul says at the beginning of this that I may know him. And I want to rephrase that slightly with this sentence. And here's the sentence I would like for us to focus on. Paul is saying here, I want to know Christ. I want to focus in on those words tonight. Now, the Apostle Paul earlier in this chapter, if you go back up and read in verses prior, you'll find out that he's speaking to a group of people uh, at Philippi, and some of them evidently were being tempted to rest in their religious um, accolades. And they were bragging about how religious they were, or at least they were tempted to, evidently. And Paul begins making the point to them. He says, hey, look, if anybody has a right to brag about being religious, I do. And he begins in those other verses talking about how he was a Pharisee, he was a Hebrew, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, concerning uh, keeping the law. He was blameless, as blameless as anybody humanly possible. Paul knew the law and he knew how to keep it. Um, and among the Pharisees, he was at the top of his class. Okay? But as he lists through all of those religious accolades that he had, he then comes on down and he says something along these lines. He says, you know, but everything that was gained for me was lost for Christ. And I decided that I needed to give up all of my accolades so that I could gain him. Paul then, in verse 10, begins to explain what his true heart's desire is. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to break that sentence down for us tonight and look at every part of it. He begins with talking about himself. He says, I want to know Christ. I want you to understand something today. I realize that we live at a time and in a world where me-ism is at an all-time high. We got a lot of self-centered people, amen or oh me, who just want everything their way. They want to think about themselves. They don't care who else it affects. It's just all about me. Matter of fact, there's a phrase that's common right now that grates against me so hard. And the phrase and the, and the philosophy behind it basically is this. People are saying, hey, you do you. You do you and I'll do me. And, and you just go and be yourself and be happy and I'll go and be myself and be happy and everything will be okay. Well, listen, there are some applications of that where maybe it works. I understand in some areas of life it's okay to have certain tastes. And, you know, not everybody likes pizza like I do. I really like pizza. If I ruled the world, we'd have pizza three meals a day, okay? But I don't rule the world, and I don't want to rule the world, just so you know. But not everybody likes pizza like I do. And it is okay to have some personal taste and to express those. But, but here's the thing. When we get this idea that it really is all about me and nothing that I do is going to affect anybody else and, and I can just create my own reality and even create my own truth and live by my own rules and you need to get out of my way, well, that's dangerous, okay? That's not only dangerous for uh, world situations, but that's dangerous for eternity. You see, God wants us to seek Him. 
And if we simply do what our hearts tell us, our hearts are going to lead us astray. Um, while I understand that this me-ism is a dangerous thing, I do want us to also understand this. There is an I in Christianity that's important. Jesus Christ came and died for you. God loves you so much that he gave his only son that you might be saved. Um, God created you in his image. And he has a great plan for your life. There's some scripture that I want to read for us. Where in uh, Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13, David understood this. 139, Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13. Let me read it for us. You formed my inward parts and you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me were when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. We are truly fearfully and wonderfully made. And I just want you to understand tonight, um, there is a place for you in this whole equation. Uh, when it comes to Christianity, it is about you. It's just not all about you. Now, if we want to understand this properly, I just want you to realize this. Christianity is so much about you and me that it was your sin and mine that caused Jesus to have to go to the cross and pay the penalty that we can never pay. So Paul begins this statement, this one little part of his sentence in the scripture, and he says, I want to know Christ. But look at the next word in the sentence. He says, I want to know Christ. What is it that you really, really want in life? I can remember being back in high school. It was more years ago now than I care to count. But in high school, they made us take an economics class. And it was in an economics class that the teacher helped me begin to truly understand from an economy standpoint the difference between needs and wants. We need food, clothing, and shelter. Um, but we want the, the finest of food, the, the finest of clothing, and the finest houses. It's nice to supply or to satisfy our appetites with a nice steak, amen? Uh, most of it, many of us are looking forward to the day when, when the restaurants will be open to where we can go and sit down and dine somewhere. And boy, to go to a good steakhouse and get one done just to the taste that you like it. Hey, that's a case where you do you, okay? That applies there. Um, man, that would be really, really good. Uh, that would satisfy our hunger. But sometimes uh, we don't need steak. We do need to eat. We may want steak, but we just need to eat. And, and maybe some of us can identify with getting one of those round steak sandwiches. Round steak, uh, down in the county anyway, was bologna. And I can tell you I've eaten a lot of bologna in my day, probably way more bologna than I have steak because bologna is a whole lot more affordable, right? Well, we, we need food, clothing, and shelter, but we want the finer things. And it's okay to enjoy some of the finer things sometimes. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be down on enjoying great things. Uh, but I, I just want to make this point. There's a difference between what we need and what we want. Now, what Paul says here is, I want to know Christ. And he's saying here, it is the great desire of of his heart what do you want more than anything else I heard the story some time ago of a religious sage who was sought out by one of his students and, and uh, he said the, the student said to the sage I want wisdom 
and uh, the, the sage took the student down to uh, a pond of water that was deep enough for the student to get in and to go completely under the water. And the student, or the sage looks at the student and he says, go under the water and stay under as long as you can and then come up. So the student stays, goes under the water, stays for quite a long time, and he comes up and he takes a deep breath. And, and the sage asks him, what do you want? He says, I want wisdom. He says, go under the water again. Again, the student goes under the water as long as he can stay. And it's a little shorter time now, as you can imagine. And he comes back up and he takes a deep breath. And, and, and the, the sage asks him, what do you want? He says, I want wisdom. He goes, go back under the water a third time. He goes back under the water a third time, staying as long as he possibly can. And this time, just before he comes up, the sage has stepped down into the water and puts his hand on top of his head and holds him down there for two extra seconds as he tries to come up. And just for those two seconds as he's trying to come up, he then pulls his hand back and the student comes up and he's gasping for air and the sage asks him, what do you want now? And the student says, I want air. And the sage looks at him and he says, when you want wisdom as badly as you want air, you will then be ready to find it. Now, the point of this story is not to promote a new way of teaching or discipline. Please don't read that into the story, okay? The point of the story is this. When we want to know Jesus more than anything else, when he is our number one desire, then we're going to be well on that journey to knowing him better. Paul said, I want to know Christ. What do you really want right now? Do you want to know him? Look at the next words. Paul says, I want to know Christ. Uh, Paul was not going to be satisfied with just being an acquaintance with Jesus. Um, he wanted to really know him. Now, I am on social media, I'm particularly on Facebook. That is the main platform that, that I use to um, interact on social media. And the last time I checked, I have in Facebook friends, I have over 1,800 Facebook friends. Now, uh, that might make you think I'm pretty popular. Uh, I don't know what you're thinking about that, but I just want to tell you this. I'm not sure I know 18. Well, I, I'm sure I don't know 1,800 people. I know I have 1,800 connections on Facebook, but I don't know all those folks. Um, a lot of times I've gotten friend requests from folks and they're friends of other people and, and I'm glad to accept them as a friend on Facebook. I've made some requests like that and, they've, and I've had people accept me and I really enjoy that social media platform as a way to get acquainted with folks. But I, I'll just be flat out honest with you. I, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that what is posted on Facebook is not always the real person, you know, we put our highlights, we put our better things, and, and that's cool, I get that. But uh, you may not really get to know somebody just through their social media posts. And I promise you, speaking for myself, I don't really know over 1,800 people on Facebook. There are a few people that I know, people who are close to me. And I want Christ to be one of those people I really, really know. I don't want to just be acquainted with him. I want to know him. Now, Paul said, I want to know Christ. Here is the one that we're after. Here's the one we need to look to. The Savior of the world. Guys, um, Jesus is the man. He is the one who uh, is God in the flesh. He put on flesh and dwelt among us. 
He lived as one of us and identified with us through that process. And Hebrews describes to us how he's that great high priest uh, who can identify with us in our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way just like we are, yet without sin. And it was Jesus who ended up being the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And this past Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we celebrated the fact that though he was wrongfully killed and then buried, uh, uh, he did not stay in the grave. He is alive. He's resurrected. He is the Savior of the world. And he is the one that I want to know. So how do I get to know him? Well, there are various ways. Uh, one of the ways that I know Christ is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is the Spirit's job to work with my spirit and to guide me into all truth and to reveal who Christ is to, to me and to you. And it is the Spirit. It's a supernatural work of God through the Holy Spirit that helps me know who Christ is and get to know Him better. Another way that I get to know Christ is through the testimony of other believers. Man, what a blessing it is to sit down and fellowship with other people and to hear how God is working in their lives. And, you know, um, if you sat, many of you who attend here at First Church in Princeton, if you sat and talked with Sister Eula Vest for any length of time, you know that she knows God. Amen. And she's got a long, long history of following him. And if you get with people like Sister Vest and you hear her testimony uh, of how God's seen her through and the blessings that he's provided, you get to know Jesus better through the testimony of other believers like Sister Vest. But there's another way that we get to know Jesus, and that is through his word. Now, I want you to understand the word of God is powerful and from Genesis to Revelation as you read through it you will find Jesus being revealed um, we've got a lot of downtime right now don't we at least many of us do this would be a great time to look further into the Bible to take some extra time and and read both in the Old Testament and the New Testament and I promise you that as you do so in reading each of the books of the Bible you will see uh, Jesus' footprint through both the Old and the New Testament. Somebody's put this together, and I want to share it with you, um, about how Jesus can be found throughout the entire Bible. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our great high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night, leading us to a, the better promised land. In Deuteronomy, he is a prophet, the prophet just like Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's the perfect judge and lawgiver. Uh, in Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, he's the reigning king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken down walls of my life. Uh, in, in Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he is our redeemer who lives forever. In Psalms, he's the Lord my shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is my wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's the lover of my soul. Uh, in Isaiah, he is the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. In Jeremiah, he's the Righteous Branch. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wind sweeping over a valley full of dry bones, resurrecting them and reviving them and restoring them to the army that God had intended for them to be from the very beginning. In Daniel, he's that fourth man in the fiery furnace, seeing us through the hardest trials we will ever face. Uh, in uh, Joel, he is the faithful, or not in uh, Joel, I'm sorry, in Hosea, he's the faithful husband who is redeeming the backslidden wife. In Joel, after that, he is the baptizer of Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, in, in Amos, he is our burden bearer. 
In Obadiah, he's mighty to save. In Jonah, he's the God of second chances. In uh, Micah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet, bringing us good news that we so desperately need to hear. In Nahum, he is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he is God's evangelist. In Zephaniah, he is our salvation. In Haggai, he is the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is the fountain opening up to the house of David. And in Malachi, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in, our, in his wings. In Matthew, he's Emmanuel, God with us. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's that loving father running to meet the prodigal who's finally decided that he needs to come home. In John, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Acts, he is the empowerment of the church. In Romans, he's the one who justifies us by faith. In First and Second Corinthians, he is our sanctifier and the one who brings order to his church. In uh, Galatians, he is the one who justifies us and redeems us from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he is the head of the church. In Philippians, he's the God who supplies all our need. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he is the king returning at an unexpected time. In 1 and 2 Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's a faithful pastor. And in Philemon, he's the friend who sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he is, again, that great high priest who can identify with us and our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way, just like we are, yet without sin. In James, he is the great physician. In First and Second Peter, he's the chief shepherd and overseer of our souls. And in First, Second, and Third John, he is love personified and epitomized. In Jude, he's the Lord returning with 10,000 of his saints. And in Revelation, he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. My friend, we can know him. And I want you to understand, he wants us to know him. Paul's desire of his heart, he states in Philippians chapter 3, beginning of verse 10, I want to know Him. And I want to know the power of His resurrection. And unfortunately, He throws in this part. I want to know the fellowship of His sufferings. My friends, tonight as we wrap up this particular Bible study, I want to encourage you. Know Christ. He he died for you. And He loves you so very much. And He wants an intimate relationship with you with you when our desire is to know him first and foremost he honors that desire that desire will compel us to do our part to draw near to him and he promises beyond the shadow of any doubt he will draw near to us i hope you have been blessed by this bible study tonight i hope that it has encouraged you and i hope that you will grow in your faith and continue in your study of god's word I encourage you to take some time to memorize the scripture. The psalmist is right. When we hide God's word in our heart, it will help us not sin against the Lord. Thank you for your time and attention tonight. God bless you. And I look forward to seeing you again virtually on Sunday for our worship service this coming Sunday. We will be online at 10 a.m. Thank you again for your time and God bless.